Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Navigating Narcolepsy. My name is Ruth Marion. I'm your host, and I'm also Director of Content and Programs at the Sleep Forum. Uh, today, we're talking about narcolepsy, a topic that I can most certainly relate to and one that I'm also very passionate about. Um, my daughter, my adult daughter, was diagnosed with narcolepsy at age 23, and in hindsight, she showed lots of signs of narcolepsy at ages 16, um, which is a very typical of narcolepsy, as it is a very as it is an invisible and often misunderstood neurological disease. Um, that being said, I want to thank the many organizations that are out there and the researchers that are out there trying to find cures and help people with narcolepsy. Um, so. Um, Today, my first guest will be um, Claire Crisp. Um, Claire, um, Claire and I share, besides our curly hair, we <laughs> share in common that both of us have a child, her a younger child, me an older child with narcolepsy. And um, Claire and I met at a sleep conference several years ago, and it was so, um, it was, it felt so good for me to be able to talk to somebody else that could understand the things that we were going through. Um, and so Claire and I instantly connected and um, Claire had a wonderful book called Waking Matilda because her daughter named Matilda had um, was diagnosed with narcolepsy at three in England. And I'm not gonna tell you the story because I'm gonna leave that to Claire to do. Um, however, I just, you know, so she'll tell you about her story. But from that, Claire also um, started working with a wonderful organization. But before we get into Wake Up Narcolepsy, let's talk about your book, Waking Matilda, and this your your journey because I think it's your determination was in that <laughs> was just amazing. So, hi, Claire. Thank you, Ruth. Hi. So, Waking Matilda, tell us tell us what happened. How how was I mean, I know you wrote the book, I read your book, but tell the audience a little bit about your story. Yeah, thank you. Um, so th the book was actually published in 2017, which seems a long time ago now, but um, the, the, the true story started in 2010 when my daughter, Matilda, who at the time was three, developed some really confusing um, and very disabling symptoms. And we were living in... Uh, Bristol, which is in the southwest of the UK at the time. Um, so um, she developed some very crazy symptoms. I actually have a background um, as a PT, so I was very aware at the time, I think, that um, it was two things. One of them that she was very sick, and the other was that it, whatever it was, it was neurological. But it took another five months or so <laughs> to get a diagnosis, which actually isn't um it sounds terrible but it's actually that was actually fairly quick um so she was in and out of the children's hospital in bristol during that time having um horrendous hallucinations through the night um sleeping on and off all day and um experiencing cataplexy which of course at the time we didn't have a word for what we saw was this child who kept collapsing and sort of was conscious but sort of paralyzed. Um, so fast forward into the middle of 2010 and um, Matilda at that point was still in hospital but undiagnosed and lots of other kind of incorrect potential diagnoses had already been passed. Um, but she was looked at by a doctor from a memabad and this this is actually all in the book so I don't want to like give give it away but it was really quite a remarkable turnaround and a doctor from Amemabad came and uh, assessed her and asked us to take videos. And this is interesting because it's a really, really good way to capture cataplexy and to communicate when you're at home with your child, this is how sleepy they are because mm. it's, it's just very different when you see it, isn't it? Um, so anyway, I took the video in a few days later and he said, you know, I, I've never seen this in someone under 17, but I know what it is. It's narcolepsy. So even that still gives me goosebumps. Um, so then we had a new challenge on our hands, which was to 
find someone who could care for her because he went back to his hometown. I was absolutely devastated. Um, so we needed a specialist who could deal with a three-year-old um, with the condition and we needed treatment. And both of those things eluded us in the UK. So about 18 months later, we moved to California. And we found those two things. We found those two things. We found the specialist uh, who is Dr. Emmanuel Mino at Stanford. Um, and with that came treatment, which at the time was Zyrum. So she was very, very young at the time. Um, I think probably diagnosed as the youngest person in the world with narcolepsy. But, you know, it's interesting working with Wake Up because I get to meet all sorts of parents and patients. And we're seeing babies with narcolepsy. So things are shifting. Um, you know, I, I, I can't even imagine I have a, a you know, I'm going to tell the audience I have a three year old granddaughter. I cannot imagine a three year old mm. with that. Um, I your your strength and determination to find an answer is is just uh, amazing. Um, and she she's doing well now. I mean, she's you know, she's how, how old is is um, yeah. Milton now? Yeah, she's 14 now. So it's it's sort of strange, really, because um, she's still, you know, youngish, but we've been in we've been in this game for a long time. So uh, she's 14. She's doing well. Thank you. Um, she's on um, Zywave at night and some stim um, and some medication to control her cataplexy in the day. So um, she has good routines with uh, sleep hygiene. Um, but we, we've also hit the teens. So I don't know. Ask me that again in another <laughs> couple of years. <laughs> How is she doing? Oh dear, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I interestingly, you know, as you know, sometimes narco sometimes cataplexy can be very full on, and other times it can be very subtle. Um, in with my situation, you know, my daughter had very subtle nar uh, cataplexy, so she would just drop things all the time, and mm -hmm. I kept calling her all kinds of names like clumsy, and you know, mm -hmm. so. Um, Anyways, mm -hmm. there's that. But anyway, um, talk for a little bit. Let's talk about wake up narcolepsy a little mm -hmm. bit and how that how you transitioned into that position yeah. that you're in. Yeah, it was a surprise, actually, because I, I I think I just about got a green card. So I've been, been over here in California for um, a good few years on a visa, actually on, on the back of my husband's visa. So I was like nobody. You know, I couldn't get a social security number. I couldn't even get like. Um, you know, a Nordstrom rat card or whatever. So um, I eventually I did secure a green card. So I was like, great, I can work. Um, and I just come to the end. The book was um, published and the children were at school. Matilda was stable. And um, I was approached by Monica Gow, who's one of the co-founders of Wake Up. And I think a couple of people put my name forward. And I remember saying, uh, sure you know I've got no real idea of what this job is but it sounds like a good fit so uh, the learning curve was really steep I was taking on as executive director I'm still the ED uh, that was in um, October 2017 um, so it's an absolutely fantastic non-profit uh, dedicated to raising funds for research and also supporting uh, people with narcolepsy in their families. So it's, it's very varied. We get to work with, of course, patients, families, um, the industry, other patient advocacy groups. Um, and I have a great little team behind the scenes at Wake Up. Uh, we're all spread over the US, um, but it's been uh, an absolute honor to try and work um, in industry and also move the organization forward. So, so tell the audience, please, um, if you don't mind, some of the resources that are available. I'm, I'm stealing your show for tomorrow, I know, but. Um, oh, no, not at all. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. we can't get too much, right? Um, we can't get it out there too much. Um, mm -hmm. But you offer some really awesome resources for people with mm -hmm. narcolepsy and support groups, which I yeah. think is huge. So, yeah, the support groups is is really interesting because um, we started those in 2018 as online support groups. And this was, of course, what, you know, pre pre COVID. Um, but essentially, I really I really did believe that that was the way forward, because the condition, obviously, people with narcolepsy really struggle with, um, you know, phys long physical distances driving and, to, you know, on the other hand, it's really important that they have those connections, like you said, 
you know, when we meet each other, we're like, there's, there's this mutual understanding, this incredible relief. Here is someone who understands me and what I'm going through. So um, we started online support groups with this idea that it would open up support for people with narcolepsy literally across the world because it actually doesn't matter what time zone you're in. Um, you can come in and we do, we have people, I think we've got people from like 60 odd countries that access our groups depending on the time and what suits them. Um, and, you know, interestingly, it took a while to get off the ground. And I think a year in, we were like, you know, not many people were showing up to these groups. And then they started to kind of increase in numbers. And of course, last year, wow. Um, so we run four groups. Um, they are free. You go to the Wake Up Narcolepsy website and you'll see support groups and you can just access this portal that takes you to an organization we partner with called Support Group Central. So we, we don't just run these on Zoom. These are legally verified. Um, we have trained facilitators and we put in someone with narcolepsy as a facilitator and support group central, give us a backup. They do all the tech side of it, uh, all the legal side of it. So we run four groups and you'll see that on the website. They are um, Saturday, two on Wednesday and a pregnancy and parenting one on Tuesday. And because of the demand, we've got, lots of people in waiting rooms um so we're doubling them this summer and we're going to do very this is interesting Ruth actually because we're going to um kind of give each group an identity and this is what we've we found people have wanted through this digital world we're all in where we can kind of all access anything but within that people are really kind of craving sort of more identity so we're actually going to streamline the groups a little bit more double them up uh, we're going to do one in canada because canadian medication is different canadian healthcare is mm. different so and we're going to do an lgbtq mm -hmm. group obviously really wanting to um help and support that demographic mm -hmm. and community and also a teen group because we've heard for years you know teens need it that's been a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. because of the um, needing to make sure we get it absolutely right, what's appropriate, what isn't. Um, so we've got four groups coming out in the mid middle, yeah, late spring probably. So go to Wake Up Narcolepsy website, follow us on social media, join our e-newsletter because you'll you'll get all the information and it's easy, easy. That that's so great. I mean, so you know, you and I both know how important the support groups are. I mean, not only for people that are listening that have narcolepsy, but also for pe care caregivers as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, really, absolutely, really important, mm -hmm. especially yeah. if there's uh, any parents out there. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of commonalities that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's another good point. If we we run a special parent forum called Conversations. Uh, this is a very similar kind of model. It's it's just not run through Support Group Central because um, I actually run that one. I kind of want to keep my ear very much to the ground and know what's going on in the community. So the first Monday of every month is a group, especially for parents. And we tend to get families who are sort of new, newly diagnosed, new to the scene, lots of questions. Um, yeah, some of those meetings, it's they're very sobering. Yeah, I know, right? It's that's that's mm -hmm. so true. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, anyway, uh, Claire, thank you so much. Um, it is. I, let me let me just see if there's any questions um, uh, from the audience. Um, where can we get your book? Is one question. Oh yeah, thank you. It's on Amazon um, dot com and Amazon dot co dot uk. Um, it's an ebook as well. I think the ebook's much cheaper. I can't remember how much, but um yeah read the reviews um if you liked it leave one that would be helpful um yeah super surprised really about how once you finish a project like that it's like giving birth it's like my fourth <laughs> child except it's left home and there you go it has its own little life on Amazon. that's great um, so yeah it took uh I just think three years to write and then a big kind of press at the end to get published um had a lot of support um, and I've had a lot of good uh, reports back. I think it's really meaningful when 
you can identify with someone who's been through something similar. So, but this this one's for the children as well. Actually, this is this is for the kids because they don't necessarily have a voice for many years until later. So, no, really. I, I, yeah. So, I mean, not that I could speak for Matilda as a three year old, of course, but just as an observer and someone who um, trying to bring her back to us I think <laughs> that's wonderful it's lovely um how how another question um how do we do we join wake up narcolepsy is there a fee no 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 not at all it's um definitely has a community sense there is no fee um you can sign up for the newsletter um, and that just gives you the news. Ev all the information on the website is accessible as it should be. Um, there's no charges. In fact, we also have a philosophy to um, keep any cost, like support groups actually are free. Okay. And people might say, well, how do you do that? And we do that because we, I write grants, one of one sort of probably about 15%, something like that of my job is to find funding for programming. Um, so all of the programs, whether it's podcasts or support groups or camp for children, um, they're all funded wow. by sponsorships. So we deliver them. So we really feel like they should be free, that people with narcolepsy shouldn't be penalized in any way, certainly not financially. Um, so sign up for everything. It's all free. Um, even our webinars, we've got one coming up next month on mental health and narcolepsy. Um, again, free access. So it's it's not membership based in the fee paying sense, mm -hmm. but it's a very strong community mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, just just type in "wake up narcolepsy" and you'll you'll see it all. I, I you know I, I you know I've been um, following "wake up narcolepsy" for quite some time now. So um, and I just once again just a plug for your hard work and. Uh, making that organization so wonderful. Um, Thank you. Just want to say that. Um, yeah. I think that's all our questions for today, Claire. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love talking to you. I could talk to you, you too. Longer, you know, <laughs> but we all have to get going. Um, yeah, absolutely. Again, you. you know, uh, thank you, Claire. Your book, Waking Matilda. You know, um, everybody, please pick up a copy because it's uh, it's an amazing story. Um, and again, join Wake Up Narcolepsy, again, another wonderful organization. So thank you, Claire. Thank you. I'm going to um, say goodbye, and I'm going to bring on our next speaker, um, Jason. On. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Yes. Right. Um, um, you know, I could listen to Jason speak for hours. Um, I, Jason is known for, um, you know, his studying of the social and behavioral aspects of narcolepsy. And I've heard Jason, I don't, Jason probably doesn't know me, but I know him. Um, and as I said, you know, I could listen to you forever. Um, hello and welcome. And if you don't mind, um, you know, let's, um, it's nice to see you here today. And yeah. thank you for being with us. Yeah, likewise. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and, and just to kind of uh, echo some of the things, uh, I have actually read Waking Matilda, and it is a great book. So just wanted to also have that uh, endorsement out there as well. Yeah. Th thanks. Thanks for that. Um, you know, I, yeah, me too. Um, you know, there's a lot of behavioral and social aspects of narcolepsy that really goes on, uh, you, know, you know, just um, ignored, um, I know. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, and I'd like you to, if you don't mind, just speak a little bit about that to our audience. And what are the, some of those aspects that are, um, that go along with having narcolepsy? Yeah, sure. And, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying, you know, this comes from some of our research we've done on people with narcolepsy as well as some of my clinical work and observations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it sort of goes into two different categories. Um, and there's some common denominators, but the first one is the path of getting diagnosed. So here, a lot of people talk about just the frustrations with being sent quite often to a mental health provider where it gets dismissed as, as depression or a mental health issue. And they spend years trying to work with therapists until they finally get to a sleep specialist who then brings them in the lab like, oh, well, you have narcolepsy. And I wish you would have come sooner. 
And so there's a lot of frustration, I think, in just that journey to get diagnosed. So I think that's one area where, you know, we really need to do a lot more work. Um, and it's something I've heard, you know, quite repeatedly from different patients and different people with narcolepsy uh, I've worked with. Once they get into treatment, um, then uh, there still are a lot of issues with the mental health aspects. A lot of this has to do with the challenges of having narcolepsy symptoms. Uh, in, in one of our research studies, what really struck me is that we did, first of all, I should say we, we did some interviews. So these are um, uh, what we call focus groups, which really is a uh, strategy and a technique we borrow from advertising that people have done in science when you're trying to develop an intervention and get to know uh, from the, your target audience, you know, what works and what doesn't. And so we sat down with people with narcolepsy and asked them like, well, what works and what doesn't work with your current treatments uh, from mental health providers? And like, by and large, what we heard is that they don't understand what it's like to have narcolepsy. They don't even understand narcolepsy was, you know, a common complaint. And so again, here, I think then that people feel like they're asked to do things that they just can't do just fundamentally like look you know it's not a matter of trying to increase my daytime activities i'm not just depressed like you know other people with depression i have a sleep disorder that doesn't provide the level of energy so you know these are some things that i think are challenges and and the other thing that really struck me uh where i was going earlier is that it's not just the fact that people with narcolepsy are sleepy it's the fact that that sleepiness is constant and it's unpredictable and so it's the quality of that sleepiness that I think is really distinguishes it from other sleep disorders. Uh, I was on another presentation earlier today where we talked about challenges with insomnia and there people aren't happy with how they're functioning during the day either. But one difference is that usually with people with insomnia, once they get some sleep, they feel better. Whereas people with hypersomnia, people with narcolepsy, they can get eight or nine hours of sleep at night and it doesn't necessarily recharge the batteries. And I think, as a psychologist and a mental health provider, that is a that source of stress, the constancy and the unpredictability is very, very challenging to navigate. And I think it really leads to a lot of challenges with depressive symptoms, with anxiety. Um, we don't quite know whether or not it's something that is part of the condition of having narcolepsy. For example, is there something in the brain that also leads to depression and anxiety? Or is it more of a response to some of the symptoms of narcolepsy? So again, I think there's still some work to be teased out there uh, about that relationship. Hard to not know when you wake up in the morning if you're going to have a good day or a bad day, right. a sleepy day or an awake day. That has to be challenging, I would think. And um, so depression is one of the symptoms, I would say, or, or are you, are you call it a symptom? I'm not really sure. Or, I mean, there are others too, anxiety. Um, and then some narcoleptics also suffer from insomnia. Mm -hmm. And also right. that's another, another problem or another challenge that we could see. Um, what are some of the things, how do you manage it? How do you manage those, those things, uh, those, those symptoms of depression and anxiety? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, you know, so right now, I think the short answer, unfortunately, is not very well. Um, you know, and that's what some of our early research uncovered. And part of the reason why I got more interested in this area is it does seem like the current treatments we have for depression and anxiety that we typically give to people who are experiencing those conditions, uh, they're not working quite as well with people with narcolepsy. Mm. And, and mainly because of some of the issues that I described uh, earlier that there are some unique factors in narcolepsy. Um, you know, in addition to kind of what I said about just the constancy and the, the unpredictability of the, um, the, the sleepiness, there's also other social issues. For example, you know, we've heard pretty consistently from people with narcolepsy that when they go and try to explain their condition to other people, oftentimes the response they get is rather it's either dismissive, it's something that people make fun of, they're like, oh, I wish I had narcolepsy, I'd love to sleep all the time. And although the other person might not intend it to be mean or mean spirited, uh, you know, like people with narcolepsy feel like, hey, look, that's not, you know, this is no fun to have narcolepsy. This is not something you want. So there's also this social stigma that comes with it. And, and if you look at the media, the portrayal of movies and so forth, oftentimes characters with narcolepsy are not portrayed in a very positive light. So, you know, there's also kind of these social aspects that even when they try to explain their condition to other people, it's misunderstood. 
uh, and oftentimes it, there's a, a negative uh, you know aspect to that. So you know what we've tried to do is put together a program that we think can address some of these needs that are quite unique or specific to narcolepsy because it doesn't seem to be addressed in other areas. So uh, we actually had a study that we published in the December issue of Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine that was kind of our first pilot study that we call cognitive behavior therapy for hypersomnia. CBTH mm -hmm. is the shorthand that we call it. Uh, and it's designed to be a, uh, a, a multi-component program with different tools aimed at helping people manage narcolepsy. So, you know, you were saying earlier that, um, you know, it's challenging to wake up, not know how you're gonna do. So one of the things we encourage people to do is to take your day and split it into smaller segments. So it really comes from a time management strategy where you take larger chunks of time and split it into small, uh, smaller chunks of time so that it's more manageable. And that way, if something comes up, and let's say you have energy in the morning, but suddenly you start to run out of energy, then you know you can kind of change and deal with that smaller segment maybe in a different way so you know basically we're trying to give people some tools to be adaptive um, to help manage and organize their day maybe in a way that they haven't thought about and maybe also just some other emotion regulation strategies that have been helpful in other conditions where there's a chronic stress for example uh, people with cancer going through cancer treatments and so forth there's a lot of psychosocial interventions that can help people navigate that um, and also people with chronic pain. So that's kind of what we see is we're trying to fill a, what we see as a gap in the care for people with narcolepsy so that it's not just medication, but also they're working with someone who could help improve the quality of life overall. Um, that's great, Jason. That's great, Jason. I, I, you know, I was thinking about, um, if you have one more minute, I was thinking about COVID and how that have, has affected um, people with narcolepsy yeah um i mean you know i i think that um i imagine there's some specific aspects of it um probably you know things like just being stuck in one place one environment might be challenging it's probably you know you're more prone to being sleepy things like that um i i was working with this one uh person with narcolepsy uh, a younger person where she said that a challenge was uh, she was in college. And so, um, you know, a lot of her classes now have shifted to being online. And so she talked about some of the challenges of trying to pay attention. You know, we, we talked about like some strategies of like walking around and she brought up that like, well, you know, that's, uh, you know, was, that might not be feasible because the, I guess their instructions are to leave your camera on. And so we try to work with her about like, well, you know, can you communicate with your professor that like, you know, you're not trying to be rude. Uh, but you, know, you have a medical condition. And so, you know, I think there's some challenges like that. I think the other challenges that aren't specific to narcolepsy, but something we're all struggling with, um, but in particular people with sleep issues, probably, you know, this would raise anxiety and depression is the fact that like, we're stuck at home. <laughs> you know, we're limited in what we can do, where we can go. And on top of that, we're bombarded with news constantly. You know, it's like, it seems like there's a constant ticker of like coronavirus cases, the deaths, the positivity rate. I mean, it's as if someone wanted to conduct an evil experiment and said like, all right, we're going to see what humans can take. And, you know, we're going to throw them all these stress. I mean, it's hard to imagine a more stressful situation than being stuck and being bombarded with negative information. So I think just there's a lot of mental health challenges uh, all around, you know, uh, even beyond just, you know, having narcolepsy. But I think, you know, even with that, it makes it all the more challenging. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can, I, as I told you, um, or as you might have heard, my daughter has narcolepsy and she's, um, she, she's older, old and, and adult child of mine has narcolepsy. Um, so I can understand the COVID thing has really, I know it's thrown everybody's sleep off. So I can only imagine mm -hmm. what it does to people that already have a sleep disorder. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, um, I had another couple of questions here uh, for you. How, has has ha, does having narcolepsy? You know, I know I've noticed a lot on a lot of so, some of the sites, the narcolepsy support group sites. Um, sadly, some people seek outside, like you know, substance, a street drug, I would say, to mm -hmm. manage their narcolepsy. And is that something common that you find? 
Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think me and, and the role I play in the clinic, um, that doesn't come as up as much because I'm probably more on the tertiary side, meaning that there's a few different layers and other people they go through before they get to someone like me. So usually other people would have caught that, discussed it with people. Um, but I think before, you know, this kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier, that there's oftentimes a long journey to even getting diagnosed from when you start having some symptoms you know, to the time when someone actually sit, you know, sits you down and says, all right, look, you have something called narcolepsy, here's what it is. And I think during that time, a lot of people think that it's just me. And so they start to try to, you know, do what they can to deal with this. Like, oh, I think I'm, I thought I was just a sleepy person. And in order to try to function, you know, like other people, sometimes they may resort to things like sleep drugs. So I think it is something that I think there is some some research showing that there's a higher um, a higher use of, of some, uh, you know, illicit drugs or street drugs, uh, those are mostly like wake promoting. So people oftentimes are just grasping at different things uh, to try to keep themselves awake. In some cases, you know, there are some other street drugs like cocaine that are also stimulants. So, you know, unfortunately they may turn to something like that. Um, but uh, there's also just abuse of other, you know, prescription medications that can happen. But by and large, I think the, the bigger issue isn't so much that this population abuses uh, stimulants. That, that's oftentimes a fear of uh, people prescribing these things. But really, the, the issue is that they don't they don't use it as much, uh, mainly because there are some side effects of stimulants. So oftentimes, people with narcolepsy they may take some days off because you know they, there's appetite suppression, and you know they might on the weekends if they don't you know need to go to work they may not take it. But sometimes that inconsistent use of it actually can impact their symptoms and create some waxing and waning of their symptoms. So uh, it, it's just, yeah, it, it's a challenge. And I think, you know, part of it is just to appreciate that challenge and to try to look at this from the patient's perspective. I, I think forums like this, um, and also just another plug for wake up narcolepsy, but groups like that are really helpful because I think part of the challenge is getting the word out there, what is narcolepsy to everybody, not just to people with narcolepsy, but people that don't have it so that they're not put in that position that you described as being teased or laughed at for, for something that they cannot control. Um, so that's why I think that this forum is really good. And, and I think, Groups like, as I said, like uh, Wake Up Narcolepsy and other narcolepsy groups are great for that reason. Um, and I think that is really all our questions for today. Did you um, have anything else that, Jason, that you'd like to tell our uh, listeners? Or um, well, I guess just one plug, if, if you don't mind, is that uh, you know on this topic of mental health, we do have a research study right now that's going on that is using some techniques from mindfulness meditation to help people deal with you know the emotional aspects of narcolepsy help them cope with it uh, we call this uh, study ascent so a s c e n t like the word ascent going up um, so if they're interested they can actually send an email to ascent at northwestern.edu um, and, uh, and it is something, so the inter it is an intervention. Uh, so we are teaching people these mindfulness techniques and um, it's done in small groups and it's actually done through uh, video conferencing, like through Zoom. So we're recruiting people from all over the country. Um, and um, uh, the minimum age for this one is 18. So you do have to be an adult, unfortunately. You know, we hope to have something, you know, available to, uh, to adolescents and those under 18. Uh, but just if anyone's interested or if anyone knows of somebody who might be interested, uh, please send us an email and then we'll uh, set you up with the next steps or talk more about the study. But, you know, it's something that could be a, um, uh, a good resource, especially, as you mentioned, things like COVID right now. You know, the nice thing is that with, um, you know, more of the uh, video delivery and telehealth delivery of interventions, it makes it more accessible to people so they don't actually have to even leave their home. Uh, they can get access to a program like this. That's excellent, Jason. I'll make sure that us at the Sleep Forum gets out that information to everybody uh, because mm -hmm. I think that's great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, sure, thanks. And thanks, thanks for being here. Um, really, really appreciate you talking with us today. Mm -hmm. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.
Uh, hello, everybody. Again, um, I'm sorry that Dr. Emmanuel Mignot had to leave. He had um, something else came up, so he could not join us on this broadcast on this. Uh, but however, we will have another narcolepsy, navigating narcolepsy broadcast. So we're going to try to get Dr. Emmanuel Mignot to make sure that he can be on at that time. Um, right now, I'd like to say a big thank you to all our speakers and for the, to the audience for coming and participating with us today. Uh, we do hope that you got something out of your time today at Navigating Narcolepsy. Uh, a quick word from our sponsor, which is Sparkle 1501. Um, if you're living with narcolepsy, your excessive daytime sleepiness makes daily life frustrating. Sudden sleep attacks can make necessary tasks like driving and working with loved ones exhausting. If you are 18 to 65, and have been diagnosed with narcolepsy, you may be eligible to participate in this clinical trial. The main purpose of the study is to look at how safe and tolerable this investigational drug is and how it may affect your narcolepsy symptoms. Travel support and con compensation for study participation is available. To learn more, we'll put up our link at thesleepforum.com. Thank you again for being with us today and have a re great rest of your day.